Come on in, welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about Survivor's most invisible returning players. I've previously talked about Survivor's purplest players, putting the spotlight on the JPs, Leafs, and the Purple Kellys of the world. But what about returning players? I mean, they were brought back for a reason. There's no way Survivor would sandbag them in the edit, right? Apparently not everyone can get Boston Rob or Russell Hance screen time on their second go round. Sometimes returning players are just downright invisible. Just like in my ranking of the most invisible newbies, we'll be using confessional count averages on their returning season to determine visibility. And look, using confessional averages across episodes to determine visibility is like the electoral college. It's not a perfect system, and there's probably a better way to do things, but I'm kinda lazy, so it'll have to do. To continue the electoral college metaphor, if Boston Rob is Florida and Russell Hans is Texas, then which returnees are Wyoming and Rhode Island? Let's figure that out. All that said, let's dig into Survivor's five most invisible returning players ever. At number five is Ozzy in Survivor Game Changers with a confessional average of 0.89 per episode. The times they are a change in. In Ozzy's first and third season, he had more confessionals than the winner. In his second season, he had one confessional less than the winner. In Game Changers, he's third from the bottom in confessionals, only beating out the first and third boots. Hey, you are within spitting distance of getting as many confessionals as Haley. Keep your chin up, bud. I'm frequently very hard on the Game Changers cast for looking like someone hit randomize on the Brant Steel cast generator, but Ozzy's one of the few players this season you could argue actually belongs. Although it's not like he invented split votes or anything, he just dove in the water real cool. But it's a low bar. And yet, despite all that, Ozzy's almost entirely irrelevant to the entire Game Changers narrative. He started on the Nuku tribe and quickly fell into all his old traps, providing for the tribe and beating the challenge strength drum. To be fair to Ozzy, his social game is probably at its best here. After getting swapped to Tavua, he does bury the hatchet with Sari, finally making some wine out of those 10-year-old sour grapes. Ozzy's partially invisible because he didn't see Tribal Council until episode 5, but also because, honestly, nothing much noteworthy really happens with Ozzy this season. He's present at two historic Tribal Councils, but he's not a main player at either of them. Although he does tell Varner to eat shit, so that's pretty cool. Jeff, you should be ashamed of yourself. I am. Ozzy goes out second after the merge when the Majority Alliance blindsides him, largely for Debbie to add a big move to one of her many resumes. It's a bizarrely unceremonious end to the story of a guy who was once one of the most popular players to ever play. He's barely present in his own boot episode, and one of his two confessionals on the episode he gets voted out is an ad for Marshalls. Marshalls put together an amazing spa experience for us, and this is the biggest reward we've had yet. Sure, we get some impressive challenge performances and some fishing montages, but the luster of Ozzy is completely gone by season 34. Jeff Probst famously said that he didn't want Ozzy on Game Changers and that CBS had to really convince him. And in hindsight, Jeff is right. Although Jeff also fought for Haley and Jeff Varner, so take that for what you will. At number four is Joe in Survivor Edge of Extinction with a confessional average of 0.78 per episode. Now the books are a little cooked on this one considering that Joe was technically in the game for every episode due to the edge, but even if we remove that from the equation, Joe is really, really invisible this season, one of the least visible players on one of the least visible tribes ever. Current uh, troubles aside, going into Edge of Extinction, of all four tribe captains, I was most excited about Joe. Possibly my worst preseason take in history, and this is coming from a guy who thought Stephanie Gonzalez was going to win Ghost Island. Here's why I was so high on Joe. In pregame press, he seemed genuine about mixing up his game and playing a more cutthroat, strategic survivor game. He seemed to recognize that he played the exact same nice guy good at challenges game in both his seasons and it got him roughly the same placement. 
clearly something is not working, why not mix it up? Plus his new modern pirate look was pretty cool. He's just some black eyeliner and a couple beads in his hair away from being Captain Jack Sparrow. So I was quite optimistic about Joey Amazing. Now, stop me if you've heard this one before, but on the island, Joe fell into his same old traps of providing for the tribe and winning challenges. There's not much to Joe's game this season, and he's barely there as a character. He aligns with Aubrey and the one other player on his tribe who doesn't hate returnees, Aurora, carries his tribe to the merge, and gets voted out as a consensus boot at the first tribal council he attends. But now, with a mustache. Just like with Ozzy, there's not much to Joe's game this go-round to highlight. We've seen it all before, there's nothing new. Except now he gets out Joed by Chris on the edge of extinction. With all this in mind, it's even weirder then that Joe was one of the few players highlighted with their own reunion segment. By this point, who even remembers that Joe was on this season? And yet here Jeff is, making Joe promise to return to Survivor until he wins. Oh God. Wow, can't wait for the new and improved Joe 4.0. This next time he'll probably have a new hat. At number three is the captain of sports herself, Danielle in Survivor Heroes vs. Villains, with a confessional average of 0.66 per episode. Heading into Heroes vs. Villains, Danielle was probably not one of the more highly anticipated choices. I don't know that I'd call her one of the five most notorious women villains in history. I mean, she wasn't even the most villainous woman on Kasaya. And if you're gonna be the random casting choice in an all-star season, then you better win or come very close if you want screen time. And even then, Results not guaranteed. Unfortunately for Danielle and all the Double D fans out there, she did not win. For basically the entire pre-merge, Danielle is invisible. We're occasionally reminded of her existence, but only in relation to Parvati and Russell. While Danielle was definitely one of the bigger strategic forces in Exile Island, in Heroes vs. Villains, she's narratively relegated to the role of Parvati's sidekick, the obvious third wheel in their alliance with Russell. To give credit to that alliance, they did manage to turn a 6-3 minority into a majority somehow and take control of the villain's camp. So good for them. At the merge, Danielle votes with the villains until final seven, when a jealous Russell leads the charge to vote her out, accidentally taking out the last person he could beat at final tribal. Whoops. I think Danielle's lousy edit does make sense in context. She wasn't a big name heading into the season, she wasn't pulling the strings on the island, and she was playing second fiddle to two players who made the end while she did not. Danielle's turn in Heroes vs. Villains would be one of the least memorable returning player appearances ever, if not for an unforgettable reward in episode 11, where she wins an overnight stay in the home of Robert Louis Stevenson, finally getting some much needed stress relief away from the game. Welcome to Treasure Island, Danielle. I gotta say, the highlight of Danielle as a character across two seasons of Survivor is this reward right here. While watching Treasure Island in bed with Amanda and Colby, Danielle finds an idol clue in their bowl of popcorn. Amanda tries to steal Danielle's idol clue, they wrestle over it, and Colby literally could not care less. I love that he pauses the movie while they're arguing. The man really did just want to watch Treasure Island. I didn't even see what happened. I was watching Treasure Island. Colby's gone on record saying this isn't exactly how it went down, and the footage of the idol find was manipulated and out of order. Who knows if their later fight was, but I don't know. Could they really count on Danielle to believably reenact a scene? I'm not so sure. Gavin, you need help. Real help. I can't help you. Yeah, I rest my case. At number two is Kelly Wigglesworth in Survivor Cambodia with a confessional average of 0.56 per episode. 
Between the fan vote for the cast, the campaigning for said votes, and finally getting to leave worlds apart behind, the lead into Survivor Cambodia was an extremely hype time to be a Survivor fan. I think many longtime fans were pretty skeptical that the casual audience would vote in all the old schoolers, but shockingly, outside of Shane and T-Bird, which still mad, they all got on. Watching the cast get on the bus at the Worlds Apart finale was one of the most exciting moments in Survivor history. How would old school players like Kimmy, PG, Terry, and Kelly play? What have they been up to? Who have they been outing? For longtime Survivor fans, Kelly Wigglesworth was one of the biggest mysteries. Here we have a woman who lost Survivor's first season by a single vote, someone who is undoubtedly an important figure in Survivor lore, and who almost immediately disappeared once her season was over. Finally, an opportunity to catch up with one of Survivor's white whales. So far, so good on the first episode. Kelly fittingly gets the first confessional of the season. We see her as a main part of the old school alliance on Takeo. We understand her position in the game, told in her own words. Then she completely disappears for seven episodes, popping up in episode nine as an apparent major social threat that's gotta go now, which she does. Um. Okay, some quote-unquote invisible players are featured heavily in camp life scenes, or their few confessionals are really memorable. They're not as invisible as the confessional stats would have you believe. Not so with Kelly Wigglesworth in Cambodia. She is completely scrubbed from the narrative in her second season, and says and does nothing memorable at all. And while it's hard to justify a six episode stretch of no confessionals, it's also easy to understand why it happened. I'm genuinely not sure why Wigglesworth came back to Survivor. It's clear she didn't care about it, she'd never even seen it, and she seemed aggressively uninterested in making an interesting television product. Kelly apparently refused to play ball with the producers, didn't want to relate this current experience to her former one, and gave Terse short answers in response to confessional prompts. Just look at literally any interview with her to get an idea of what they were dealing with. What's something that will blow fans' minds that happened out there in one of your seasons but never made it to TV? We almost got blown off the island during a hurricane on day nine. Ah, uh, okay, you don't want to elaborate there? Would you play again if asked? No. Oh, all right, well, I'm sure you won't have to worry about that problem. The most invisible returning player in Survivor history is Courtney in Survivor Heroes vs. Villains, with a confessional average of 0.44 per episode. Four confessionals across nine episodes. And yet, Courtney is still pretty memorable in Heroes vs. Villains. All credit to Courtney, the woman makes the most of her confessionals. I don't think a whole lot has changed from the Courtney of China to the Courtney of Heroes vs. Villains. She plays essentially the same loyalty-based game, swapping out an alliance with Todd and Amanda for one with Sandra, Rob, and Tyson instead. It was pretty smooth sailing for them until Tyson voted himself out, putting Courtney and company at the mercy of Russell Hance. But let's be real, no one stands Courtney for her strategic chops. It's all about her effortlessly hilarious takedowns. I mean, let's face it, he's like a bandy-legged little troll who, you know, sort of like scampers around with his tooth missing. There are two reasons, in my opinion, why Courtney is so invisible in Heroes vs. Villains. One is, she's simply not terribly important to the story being told this season. The villain's story pre-merge is about the rise and fall of Rob, and the fall and rise of Russell. The post-merge, it's about Sandra carrying the torch for her fallen alliance. Courtney's story just doesn't fit in conveniently anywhere. Sure, she's in the main villain alliance for the first part of the game, but she's not the head of that alliance, nor is she the only one who survives to the merge. Like Danielle to Parvati, or even Tyson to Rob, Courtney is in the sidekick role to Sandra, riffing on the cartoon characters they're stuck with and warming the bench with her bestie, all pre-merge. Two, it doesn't take much for Courtney to make an impression. One confessional from Courtney is worth, like, seven from someone else. The exchange rate is insane. Production knows that she's a master of the confessional art, that she makes maximum impression with minimal effort. With that in mind, she really got like 30 confessionals in Heroes vs. Villains. 
not four. Like, how many of Amanda's 20-plus expressionless confessionals from this season do you remember? And yet here's Courtney, giving gold away for free. Wow, she was just having the time of her life out there, wasn't she? Got nothing else for ya. Don't be a bandy-legged troll. Like and subscribe and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.